Welcome to lecture two. The topic for lecture two is vaccination. In this lecture, we will talk about what immunity is, um, the different types of immunity, and what happens if the immune system is not working properly. Uh, we will also look at the history of vaccine development as well as the different types of vaccines that are available. So immunity, what is immunity? Basically, immunity is the resistance to disease-causing organisms. So generally speaking, uh, disease-causing organisms are uh, referred to as um, pathogens, and um, there are different types of pathogens uh, that you might be familiar with. Um, there is uh, bacteria, um, there is virus, there is fungus. Uh, these are the common types of uh, pathogens um, that could cause illnesses uh, in in the body uh, and so our immune system's job is to prevent these pathogens from uh, from causing uh, the diseases uh, by you know killing them uh, or if sometimes we are not able to get rid of them fast enough um, then we, we we would get sick uh, but ultimately um, the job of the immune system is to um, destroy the invading pathogens uh, and to help us uh, recover from the illness. One of the most important feature of the immune system is the ability to distinguish self uh, from non-self. So um, your immune system uh, has these cells called uh, white blood cells, which is this purple guy right here. So this is white blood cell. Uh, and it's able to uh, check on the surface of all the cells um, that it comes in contact with. And what it's trying to check for um, is something called a cell marker, okay, self marker. Um, so all the cells within your body has a, has a set of unique markers called the MHC markers um, that would distinguish it from all the other cells from other individuals, okay. Um, and so uh, uh, if, you, if you look at your MHC markers, that's going to be different from uh, from from your, your your parents MHC markers there they will be similar but it's not going to be identical the only time you have identical MHC marker is if you have an identical twin okay um, and so similar situation occurs when we are talking about uh, a pathogen okay so on, on the surface of a bacteria um, there would be molecules uh, uh, which we refer them to as antigens in general um, that would tell our white blood cell um, that it does not belong to the body. Okay, so having this ability to distinguish what belongs to self and what does not uh, is the key uh, uh, characteristics of the immune system. You don't want to be attacking the wrong thing. Okay, if you if you're not able to tell your own cells apart and you start attacking them, then you might uh, have what we call autoimmune diseases. Okay, so things like lupus, uh, multiple sclerosis. These are diseases that occurs when your immune system start to attack uh, yourself. Now, generally speaking, there are two types of immunity um, that we have in the body. Um, the first type is what we call innate immunity. The innate immunity is something that you are born with. Okay, this is what we call the inherited immu immunity. Okay, you 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 got it. Uh, from your parents. Uh, it's part of your um, genetic makeup, right? So the moment you're born into this world, your innate immunity is going to be working uh, already, okay? So the purpose of the innate immunity is to defend the body against general infections, okay? So these are not tailored uh, immunity for specific disease, uh, but rather uh, it's kind of like a, a broad spectrum defense um, that would work on a wide range of basic infections. Um, this type of immunity does not change throughout the person's life. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, right, uh, it offers immediate protection. Right? As soon as you come into this world, your innate immunity is going to be up and running uh, and, and it's going to give you immediate uh, protection. And, and it will continue to give you protection uh, uh, throughout your lifetime. So um, some uh, strategies used by innate immunity to get rid of infections uh, include uh, inflammation. Right? So we all had experience of what inflammation looks like. Uh, if you cut your finger, um, then then it feels uh, warm. It's gonna 
be red, it's going to be a swollen, and it's going to be painful. Those are hallmarks of inflammation. And, you know, as bad as it sounds, uh, those things are actually the side effect of uh, what's happening in the body um, when it's trying to get rid of the, um, of the, of the bacteria. Um, and so inflammation is uh, it's a sign that your immune system is, is at work. Uh, and fever is another example of innate immunity, right? By cranking up the body's temperature, um, you are going to inhibit the growth of bacteria, for example. Uh, and at a higher temperature, you are able to have um, faster metabolism, which would help with the healing process. Um, the um, shortcomings of the innate immunity is that uh, it has limited efficacy, okay? Is not the best type of immune protection that you can have. In fact, this type of immunity is not going to be very useful if we were to be infected with some serious virus. Okay, uh, so if, if you get uh, hepatitis, innate immunity is not going to be able to protect you. If you get COVID-19, right, the innate immunity is not going to be able to protect you very well. Okay, uh, and on top of that, uh, the innate immunity uh, has no immune memory. It does not remember what it has fought off before. So if you get infected by the same thing, you kind of have to um, uh, uh, fight it from the beginning, uh, from, from, from fresh start uh, all over again. Okay? You, you, you're not going to be able to uh, remember what you have fought off uh, before. So typically speaking, if you come down with some serious infection, some very uh, bad virus or bad bacteria, that the um, where the innate immunity is inadequate, then you need to bring out the big guns, so to speak. And the big gun is the other branch of immunity, the adaptive uh, or sometimes called the acquired immunity. In this type of immunity, um, you are going to be able to create a specific immune response against a specific type of pathogens. In other words, the adaptive immunity is tailored response uh, specifically designed to fight off a specific type of infection. Okay, uh, and having said that, it means that the adaptive immunity will evolve over the life of a person. It really depends on the kind of uh, viruses and bacteria and pathogens you contract through your life, um, uh, um, and, and that's going to dictate how your adaptive immune system is going to evolve. For example, if you have um, had chicken pox before, then in your system, you would, you would have uh, 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 the adaptive um, um, tools to fight off future chicken pox infections. So you won't, you won't have to worry about that again. Right? Um, you might have, um, I don't know, uh, uh, disease A, B, and C in your lifetime. So you would have immunity against those things. Uh, and for me, right, I might also have disease A, but I've also has D and E. So my adaptive immunity would uh, provide me with protection against uh, uh, disease A, D, and E. Uh, but since I have not been exposed to B and C yet, I won't have that uh, protection. So what that means is everybody is going to have a slightly different uh, adaptive immunity. Right? It all depends on uh, what kind of pathogens they have encountered in their lifetime. And this is going to continue to evolve over time uh, uh, because we are still going to get sick uh, eventually, right? As long as we live, there's a chance we're going to get sick. So every time you get sick, you're going to add a new uh, disease to your to your um, to your adaptive immunity. So you know later on in life, maybe I contracted disease C, right? So, so now I have an extra protection uh, in my in my adaptive immunity. Um, the key um, thing here is that the adaptive immunity is able to produce antibodies, okay? Uh, and we're going to talk about what those antibodies are. They are basically protein molecules that you can produce, uh, and and they are the ultimate weapon uh, in the body, okay? If the antibodies that does not work, uh, um, then we are going to basically get very ill, and we need to, you know, take medicines and uh, and um, get extra help from, from outside of the body uh, to, to recover. Um, to make those antibodies, it kind of takes some time to develop. So um, compared to innate immunity, uh, adaptive immunity is not going to offer immediate protection. Right? It takes time 
to develop. Uh, but once you get it up and running, it is generally quite effective. And uh, kind of like an added bonus to that is you will have immune memory. Okay, You will remember what you have fought off previously. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, you know, if you encounter the same uh, pathogen in the future, you will be able to get rid of them uh, much faster. You will be able to get rid of them uh, with greater efficiency. So here is what an antibody looks like. It's kind of like a Y shape uh, uh, proteins. Uh, and, you know, there is a, is a, is a handle region here. Um, that is the same for all antibodies, okay? So we call that the constant um, region. Uh, and, and here you kind of have two arms, uh, and, and that's going to be different for each antibody that you produce, okay? So these are what we call the variable, variable regions, okay? They're a little bit different uh, for every uh, antibody. And, and to create those variation, um, you basically have to uh, shuffle your genes. Okay? You have a set of genes that are dedicated for antibody productions. Uh, and, and it's like having a deck of uh, cards. Okay? You deal out you know, uh, 10 cards every time. Um, there's a good chance that the cards are going to be different, right? Um, and, and by shoveling your genes, right, every time you're gonna be able to create um, antibodies with different variable regions. Okay? But the constant regions would be pretty much the same for all the antibodies. Now, uh, as a general rule, uh, each antibody is only going to be able to recognize one target, okay? Uh, however, your body has the potential to generate billions of different types of antibodies, right? Through the gene shuffling that I was talking about. So as an analogy, you can think of, uh, before the analogy actually, let's, uh, let's take a look at this picture. So if you produce an antibodies that would bind to the orange uh, virus here, right? You can see, um, maybe it's a little bit small, but you know, you can zoom in on the PowerPoint slide. You can see the variable region here. Uh, the groove on the end will fit the little uh, pentagons you have on the virus. Uh, and if you have an um, antibody that is going to recognize this bacteria, then the groove here would, you know, at the end would fit the uh, semicircle that is on the surface of the bacteria. So the antibody that you create to fight one thing uh, will typically not work for another pathogen. Okay, um, there are some exceptions that we will talk about later on, but generally speaking, uh, one antibody is only good for one pathogen. Okay, so if this if this thing is designed to fight orange uh, viruses, uh, it will not work when you get infected by the red bacteria, and vice versa. So as an analogy, you can think of antibodies like screwdrivers, and and the pathogens are like the screw heads. Okay, so. Uh, if you think of a whole set of screwdrivers, the handle of the screwdriver is pretty much like the, um, uh, the, the constant region of the antibodies. They are pretty much the same uh, for all the screwdrivers, okay? Subtle differences maybe, uh, but for the most part, it's, it's the same, okay? It's the part that you grab onto. Uh, and then there's the tip, okay? The tip would be different for each screwdrivers, and those tips are designed to tighten a specific type of screw heads, okay? So, it, you know, if you have, I don't actually know what these, um, I'm sure they have uh, like a proper names to call these things, but I'm just gonna call them like hexagon, for example, okay? So if, if you have a hexagon head, then you're gonna need the tip that matches the, um, the hexagon, right? You cannot tighten this with a, with a flat head, right? You cannot tighten this with a cross head, okay? So um, uh, one screwdriver is good for one type of screws, um, generally speaking. And, and then you have the whole set with you, right? Um, then you can tighten any screw, okay? Meaning, uh, even though each antibody can only attack one type of pathogens, but you have the potential to create a whole set of different antibodies. Um, so therefore, you are potentially going to be able to fight off any pathogens, okay? Um, but like I said, it takes time. So a lot of times you get very ill uh, before your body is able to find the right antibody. Uh, and that's why, you know, uh, people can still um, succumb to, to, to illnesses, okay? Now, uh, if you take a look at this, this, this uh, 
a cross head here. I think it's called a Phillips head or something. Um, so you would need a cross tip to tighten it. But, you know, if you uh, uh, don't have a cross head, then sometimes maybe you can use a flat head to, to tighten that as well. Right? So this is similar to what I said. Even though each antibody is only good for one type of pathogens, but sometimes, just sometimes, by chance, uh, they might work on multiple, multiple targets as well. So how does um, the body create antibody? Well, uh, it's based on uh, the same premise that we've discussed earlier, right? Um, is the idea, the ability of the body to distinguish uh, self versus non-self. So um, on the pathogens, um, there would be these identifier molecules called antigens. Uh, and, and, and basically, the antibody is going to uh, be targeting these antigens. So if you, if you have a bacteria here, um, and then it has antigen, you know, A, C, F, K on it, then your body will see those as um, foreign uh, markers that your body does not have, and then you will make an antibody that would tar target the K. You will make an antibody that targets the A, and so on, uh, and so forth, okay? So uh, 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 the whole process is, of course, a little bit uh, complicated, but, you know, just knowing that it's enough uh, for the purpose of this course. Once the antibodies are produced, they are able to help with the infection and clearing the infection uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, for example, they can neutralize the target uh, and make it harmless. So uh, some virus, for example, in order for them to uh, replicate, to reproduce, they need to go inside your cells. Uh, and if the antibodies are present, uh, then they will be able to, um, to neutralize them, to prevent them from gaining access into your, into your cells. Okay? Uh, another way that the antibody can work is that they could highlight the target. Um, and, and, and once they're highlighted, uh, it would attract white cells uh, to come and destroy them. Okay? So uh, in this uh, uh, um, clip here, you can see um, this cell is, um, is your white cells. Uh, and it's eating up uh, the, uh, the bacteria, which has been coated with antibodies. It kind of highlights them, um, so it makes it easier for the uh, Y cell to identify. So um, as an analogy, right, uh, uh, it's kind of like this uh, coffee bean picture, okay? So uh, the coffee beans here represent your own cells, okay? And hidden amongst your own cells is something uh, that is foreign, okay, which is the bacteria. So in this picture, um, there is a, is a face, it's a human face, uh, uh, and, and, you know, if I ask you to look for it, um, it might take you some time, okay, like it might take you, I don't know, a minute or two minutes, but eventually you will find the face, okay, um, so the antibodies works by highlighting what you're looking for, okay, so by, by tagging the thing that stands out from the crowd, so to speak, you are going to be able to identify it much quicker, right, and if you're a white cell, you'll be able to see um, that does not belong to the body, uh, and you will be able to attack it uh, right away. We will now look at the uh, different types of adaptive immunity. Um, so just to quickly recap, uh, immunity, immunity uh, is separated into innate, which is what you're born with, uh, and then there is the adaptive immunity. So within the adaptive immunity, we talk about um, how there are um, you know, cell-mediated uh, immune response, and then there is uh, antibody-mediated uh, response. But now we're going to be um, talking about uh, classifying adaptive immunity uh, based on how you uh, got the uh, uh, immunity itself. So uh, adaptive immunity is separated into uh, two categories. Um, we have what's called um, uh, active, active, uh, adaptive immunity and we have uh, passive uh, adaptive immunity so in active adaptive immunity um, it is um, uh, it means the host the host which is you uh, the person my right, host uh, makes antibody okay the host themselves are responsible for making the antibodies uh, uh, and on the other hand for the passive for the passive uh, adaptive immunity um, rather than making their own uh, antibody, the host uh, receives receives antibodies. 
okay receives antibodies so um, they're going to get it from someone else uh, uh, and we're going to look at some examples of it later um, because you are making your own antibody in active uh, uh, immunity then it's going to take some time so this is not immediate not immediate protection uh, however you will be making memory cells uh, and therefore is going to be long lasting okay? long lasting uh, on the other hand, for passive uh, uh, immunity, uh, because you're receiving the antibodies from someone else, uh, it's going to be giving you immediate protection. As soon as you receive those antibodies, you're going to be protected. Uh, but because you did not make the antibodies yourself, uh, that means you don't have the uh, memory cells for it, and so this will be, be short-term. Okay? It's kind of like cheating on a test. If you cheat, you get the answer right away, but you won't remember anything. But if you study, you won't remember everything right away. Uh, but once you take the time to study, you will get long-lasting uh, memory. So uh, under active immunity, uh, there are two examples, uh, two, two categories rather. Uh, we have natural and we have uh, artificial. artificial okay same thing for passive okay so we have natural passive and we have artificial passive okay uh, another word for artificial uh, sometimes you see textbook right induced induced okay so natural just means it happens naturally uh, and artificial means you deliberately um, do something to trigger it okay so therefore there are three um, uh, uh, types of adaptive immunity in terms of how you get that in the first place. Um, so there's natural active, artificial active, natural passive, and artificial passive. Let's take a look at the uh, um, specific examples for these things. So let's start with natural passive. Natural means it just happens, right? Uh, 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 a good way to tell whether something is natural or not is to think about if this could happen thousands of years ago, okay? So uh, uh, um, in the case of, um, of, of, of breastfeeding, um, it's considered as natural. And passive means uh, you get the antibodies from uh, another person. So in this case, that other person is going to be the mother, right? Um, the mother can transfer antibodies to the baby uh, through the placenta, right? Uh, and, and we actually know this, right? We know uh, for RH um, uh, sensitization, right? for hemolytic disease of the newborn, uh, the RH antibodies actually cross the placenta to attack the baby's uh, uh, red cells. Uh, but in this case, we are talking about good antibodies. So if the mother has uh, uh, anti-measles antibodies or something, those will be able to cross the placenta and uh, go into the baby's uh, body and to protect the baby that way. Um, these antibodies will disappear soon, um, within a few months, uh, and then the baby will be susceptible again. Um, um, and so the mother can prolong these uh, uh, protections by breastfeeding the baby. Okay, so um, breast milk actually contains uh, antibodies, uh, and those um, can um, uh, offers protection for the baby as well. Okay, so these are this is example of natural passive. Okay, it's natural because it, you know it happened naturally, and passive because uh, the mother makes the antibody, not the baby, not the host. Okay, so once the breastfeeding stop, right, the baby would have to eventually make their own antibodies um, by encountering. Um, the, um, the illness through uh, through other means. Uh, artificial passive, okay, so artificial means is deliberately done and passive means uh, you did not make the antibody yourself, right? So um, there are two examples of this. Uh, artificial passive can be used as a, as a preventive uh, measure, okay, prevention, uh, or it can be used as a treatment, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna tell you um, uh, about this um, right now. So uh, we can use it to prevent an illness uh, in, in someone who has been exposed to an uh, uh, infectious disease, right? Um, so we actually can take um, antibodies from someone who has immunity for a particular disease and we can purify the antibodies from that person uh, and then we can use that uh, and give it to someone else. So here's an example, right? If a healthcare worker uh, who accidentally stabbed themselves with a, with a needle 
um, uh, and that needle was just pulled out from someone with hepatitis, then there's a real chance that the healthcare worker uh, is going to uh, have hepatitis. So as an immediate treatment, um, what you can do is uh, the person can receive an antiviral antibodies injection, and and again, uh, this is this is what we call a serum, uh, which is basically purify antibodies from someone who has the immunity uh, against hepatitis in this case, uh, and then that will uh, help prevent the virus from causing the infection uh, in the person. Okay, so there are wide ranges of uh, uh, diseases that can be treated this way, right? so including botulism. Botulism is like a type of food poisoning, right? You might not have heard of botulism, but you probably have heard of like Botox, right? Botox uh, is uh, injecting um, something right underneath the uh, the skin uh, and takes the wrinkle away, right? So that something is actually the same toxin that causes uh, botulism, right? It causes your uh, uh, muscle to become paralyzed, and in high doses, it could cause you to to die. Um, so so if you come down with botulism, right, you can use a serum. Uh, to 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 treat that right, um, and that's an example of artificial passive immunity. Uh, rabies, if you get bitten by like a stray dog or something. Um, tetanus, if you get cut by rusted nails, for example. Um, so the protection is immediate, right? You will uh, have the an antibodies to fight these things right away, but it's short term. So next time you get bitten by by another dog, right? Um, then you will need another another serum. Right, so that's an example of artificial passive. Right, you're injecting something into yourself that's uh, artificial, and it's passive because someone else uh, gave you the antibody. Um, you can also use this as uh, as um, as a type of uh, preventive uh, measure uh, rather than treatment. Um, so let's say I have to go on uh, a business trip tomorrow uh, to some place with a very uh, prevalent disease. Okay, uh, and um, I don't have time to get a traditional vaccination, so I can ask for a serum. Right? So by getting the antibodies, I will be protected for that disease immediately. Uh, but after I return from my trip, then uh, I will I will lose that immunity because again, it's not it's not meant for long term protection. Okay, passive immunity are are just going to be good for short term. Next, we have natural active immunity. This is perhaps the one that you're most familiar with. Uh, let's say you contracted chicken pox, you go through, went through the symptoms of having the pox, uh, but then you recovered and now you're protected for life, right? You're only um, going to get chicken pox once in your lifetime. That's because once you recover from it, you are going to have the um, uh, memory cells for it, uh, and so you're not going to get it again. Some people do get it as in the form of shingles uh, later on in life, but you know that's uh, that's not uh, the majority of the population. Um, next is artificial active. So this is to get vaccinated against a particular disease, right? So in the vaccines, you would uh, have a, a weakened form of the virus or of the bacteria. And sometimes it's the dead version of the uh, bacteria or the virus. Um, and, and you use that weak conversion to educate your uh, immune system and you will produce antibodies against uh, that uh, and create a memory cells. So when the real thing comes, you are going to be to be protected. Okay? Because the actual virus and the actual bacteria uh, is not used in the vaccines, it's impossible to get sick uh, from, the, uh, from the vaccines uh, themselves. Meaning, if you are going to get vaccinated against chicken pox, you're not going to get chicken pox from the vaccines, right? Same thing. If you receive a flu shot, uh, you're not going to catch the flu from the flu shot. But some people say, uh, you know, you still get a fever, you still get a muscle ache. Uh, and that's true because um, when you inject the uh, vaccines into your body, you are introducing uh, foreign antigens, right? That's kind of the whole point, right? To educate your immune system uh, about these uh, foreign antigens. Um, and, you know, anytime you have foreign antigens uh, in your system, your innate uh, immunity is going to uh, kick in as well, right? So the fever is is, is part of that, okay? But uh, it's impossible to get the um, illness from the uh, vaccines um, you're getting. You're getting. So here is uh, is a graph that shows you uh, when you uh, first uh, uh, expose to the vaccine, you're going to create uh, 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 plasma antibodies um, because of the activation of B cells and so on and so forth uh, and you know within a certain time frame if you uh, give a, a second dose of the vaccines a booster shot um, that response is much 
much uh, stronger and it doesn't come down as quickly so for this reason uh, it's not uncommon um, for the uh, vaccines to have several dose multi dose um, uh, to create the most uh, effective uh, uh, immune response so who um, came up with the uh, idea of vaccinations okay so um, in the history of mankind uh, we have only successfully uh, uh, eradicated one uh, 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 disease and that is smallpox okay so uh, smallpox is a very serious contagious infectious disease uh, caused by the variola uh, virus okay so people who had smallpox uh, they would get a fever they would get a really really distinctive rash like this one uh, and most people with smallpox recover but about three out of ten uh, that's a 30 percent uh, mortality rate Okay, so that's that's really 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 big right uh, and some people who survive will have uh, permanent scars all over their body um, especially their faces uh, and some are left blind blind so uh, very devastating disease and uh, there were no uh, no no effective treatment for it um, and so um, there was this English physician um, his name was uh, uh, Edward Jenner okay so Edward Jenner um, uh, he uh, observed that uh, the milkmaids, the people who milk its cows, uh, they got the chicken. Uh, they got something called the cowpox from the cows. Okay, uh, and then uh, he noticed that um, if they recover from the cowpox, then they do not show any symptoms of the smallpox when exposed. So here's the story. Okay, he has a cow. The name of the cow was Blossom, uh, and uh, Blossom has some uh, uh, sores in the udders. The udders is where you get the milk right um, and so the milkmaid uh, one of the milkmaids uh, her name was uh, Sarah uh, and Sarah was milking a uh, blossom and she caught the uh, cowpox uh, from blossom and so there are these cowpox that are growing on her hands um, and then she recovered from the cowpox okay cowpox is not a uh, serious disease uh, in humans okay uh, and so uh, later on Jenna uh, found out that you know Sarah seems to be unf affected by the uh, by the smallpox so he um, he uh, theorized that uh, if you recover from cowpox maybe it will give you uh, protection from smallpox so to test his hypothesis he uh, took the gardener's son right? uh, not his own son the gardener's son right? uh, a nine-year-old boy named James and then he exposed him to uh, cowpox and uh, when the boy recovered from the cowpox uh, he didn't do something crazy he exposed the boy to smallpox uh, uh, repeatedly okay um, you know you can't do this nowadays right nowadays where right? you're gonna get sent to jail for life but back then the ethical uh, guidelines were not so clear-cut I guess uh, and it was very fortunate that uh, um, Jenna was correct that the boy actually uh, uh, did not get sick from the smallpox and you know based on what we discussed about um, antibodies um, you would know that this is a very very uh, unusual situation because typically uh, we produce antibodies um, specifically for one type of disease right and that antibodies will not work for another disease it just turns out that in this case the smallpox and the cowpox are so similar that when you get um, uh, infected by the cowpox um, you will also get protection from the smallpox so that uh, uh, began uh, the uh, uh, creation of the first vaccine uh, and uh, what happens is uh, after mass uh, vaccination um, uh, using vaccines created from the cowpox um, people uh, no longer get sick from the smallpox and uh, by the uh, uh, end of the um, um, uh, 1977 uh, there are no more uh, naturally occurring cases of smallpox okay uh, and so um, the cow blossom uh, when he died uh, when she died sorry um, the hind was made into leather and that was given to um, to, to to Canada as a gift um, and you can find the uh, hind of blossom at the medical science building uh, in uh, University of Toronto so this uh, concept was not uh, uncommon uh, of uh, you know uh, inoculating uh, 
uh, an animal version of a disease to get protection for uh, a human disease. Uh, we actually do this for uh, for tuberculosis. So um, you know, if you have a little little um, a scar on the uh, on your arm, usually the left arm, if you're right-handed, uh, there's a big scar on the uh, on the on the arm. Uh, that's from the BCG vaccine. So that is the cow version of tuberculosis, uh, and that is supposed to give you protection for the actual tuberculosis. So many people from uh, Asia country, including myself, uh, would have that um, uh, a scar uh, because we received the BCG vaccine when we were little, uh, when it was a very um, uh, 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 prevalent disease. In so now we're just going to wrap up the lecture with some uh, other stuff related to immunity, uh, some you know diseases related immunity. Uh, in this picture, you can see uh, uh, that's not a normal looking hand. Uh, that is what you get uh, when you have rheumatoid arthritis. So there is the normal kind of arthritis, which is called osteoarthritis, and that's just part of aging um, due to wearing and tearing. Uh, and this kind, uh, the rheumatoid arthritis, is an autoimmune disease where your immune system attacks the tissues in your joint uh, and causes them to form scar tissue and become deformed. It. So, um, you know, this, of course, is very, very painful. So we're going to look at um, three types of abnormalities uh, related to immune system. Uh, we're going to look, look at what happens when you have an have a, uh, overreaction uh, uh, towards something. We're going to look at uh, what happens when you have uh, uh, an underreaction. Uh, and we will also see what happens when you have the wrong type of reaction. So um, allergies. Allergies is an overreaction to something that is typically harmless, such as pollen, uh, uh, animal hair, peanut butter, right? That kind of stuff is ordinarily uh, harmless to the body, but um, you know, certain people are hypersensitive to these things. Uh, you know, we don't really have good reasons of why that is the case, uh, but genetics uh, definitely seem to play uh, a factor in that. So. Uh, the response to these antigens, right, uh, they are called the, the allergens, are usually uh, involve some kind of, uh, of tissue damage. Um, and the um, uh, um, allergic reaction involves a very specific type of antibodies uh, called IgE, IgE antibodies. Uh, and in the allergic reaction, um, the IgE uh, is going to create a very immediate response, um, and uh, you will know this if you have allergies. Okay, uh, if if it's the the pollen uh, concentration is high on a particular day, you go off for a walk, and then after half an hour, you might already have the symptoms of watery eyes and runny nose and and, and whatnot, uh, and that's caused by the IgE uh, antibodies. Um, these antibodies are actually stuck to uh, mast cells, and you might remember mast cells are the ones that are responsible for um, creating the inflammatory response and they're also stuck in the basal fields. And so uh, when the allergens binds to these antibodies, it will trigger the mast cells and the basal field to release uh, histamine, which then is responsible for the allergic uh, symptoms. And so a lot of the um, allergy drugs, um, they contain what's called antihistamine uh, and that is um, to counteract the effect of, uh, of histamine. Now, sometimes the allergic response can be very, very severe. In some people, uh, the uh, IgE-mediated allergic response uh, 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 can create what's called an anaphylactic shock. In an anaphylactic shock, um, you have a systemic, uh, systemic means the entire body, right? Systemic uh, um, uh, uh, inflammation uh, caused by uh, 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 an increased release of, of histamine and with the surge of histamine in the system uh, um, you are going to experience uh, a life-threatening drop in blood pressure um, because remember histamine is going to increase your vessel dilation and it makes them super super leaky right so by leaking a lot of fluid out of your your blood vessels um, your blood volume is going to go down and your blood pressure is going to drop significantly uh, and if you don't have enough blood pressure then uh, you know not enough blood can go to your brain uh, and then you could die from that so this is very very uh, serious uh, and it could happen very very quickly right um, so if someone is having an anaphylactic shock or if they have a history of uh, having anaphylactic shock then you know they should carry an EpiPen for them so EpiPen uh, contains epinephrine uh, which is something that your body makes um, 
you know, when you're scared or excited, right? Um, you might probably know it as uh, adrenaline, okay? Adrenaline, adrenaline and epinephrine are the same thing, okay? So by injecting a shot of epinephrine into your system, uh, it's going to reverse all that uh, uh, histamine effect uh, and it will, you know, allow you to, um, to, to basically live, right, uh, before you get to a hospital. So uh, another example is uh, uh, autoimmune disorder. This is the wrong kind of reaction. Okay, um, we are supposed to only have T cells that uh, that would attack uh, foreign antigens, right? Uh, and there are you know checkpoints in the thymus. Remember we talk about the tolerance test, right? Only uh, five percent of the T cells are supposed to come out from the thymus uh, if they pass the tolerance test. Uh, and in cases where you know we let out the wrong T cells, then uh, they will attack your own cells and that creates the autoimmune diseases. So um, there are many different types of autoimmune diseases. Here is one example, uh, Graves' disease. Um, so you have a thyroid gland uh, in you know the neck area uh, and the thyroid gland produce uh, thyroid hormone. So to keep, just to keep it simple for now, thyroid hormone basically controls your metabolism. So more thyroid hormone, higher the metabolism. So what happens is in Graves' disease, um, here is your thyroid gland, and you're going to make antibodies that would be stuck to the uh, to the thyroid gland, okay? And it turns it on uh, permanently, so it, this would keep on uh, pumping out uh, thyroid hormone. The thyroid hormones are called T3 and T4, and because you have an elevated amount of T3 and T4, your meta metabolic rate is going to spin out of control. Um, you're gonna have uh, uncontrolled weight loss because you're burning up everything you eat. Uh, you're gonna have regular irregular heartbeats. Uh, 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 going to be beating really fast uh, and the eyes are going to be a little bit bulging. Uh, these antibodies not only bind to the thyroid gland but they also bind to the muscle around the eye causing them to become inflamed and as a result your eyes are going to be a little bit bulgy. So that's an example of autoimmune disorder. Uh, finally we have uh, immuno immunodeficiency and that is when you have an underreaction okay or no reaction at all so um, this uh, comes in two forms we can have what's called primary immunodeficiency um, this is something that you're born with uh, because of genetic mutations uh, and then there's secondary immunodeficiency uh, which is something that you acquired um, uh, after birth. Um, and so an example of primary immunodeficiency is something called SCID, uh, which stands for Severe Combined Immunodeficiency. And an example of secondary uh, immunodeficiency is, uh, is AIDS, the Acquired Immunodeficiency, uh, which is caused by the HIV virus. So uh, in SCID, the person is born with no um, no immunity at all. Uh, they cannot uh, uh, produce uh, 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 um, uh, uh, acquired immunity. They don't. They cannot produce T cells and B cells. Uh, and so what happens is they would die from the most common uh, infection. Okay, they could just die from breathing pathogens in the air that you and I can deal with. But they 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 cannot do it because they lack the mechanism to do so. So uh, there is someone called the Bubble Boy. I don't know if you have heard about Bubble Boy before, uh, but this boy was born with skid and um, you know the, his parents could not touch him because just by holding him they could spread uh, bacteria to the boy and kill him so he lived in a bubble a sterile bubble uh, for uh, the majority of his life uh, and you know in uh, when he was around 12 years old um, um, they figure out a way to perform bone marrow transplantation uh, from uh, from siblings so he received uh, bone marrow transplantation from his sister and a bone marrow transplantation is uh, potentially um, going to fix this uh, because uh, bone marrow is where all the white cells come from, right? So if you get healthy bone marrow from someone else, then maybe you could re re uh, replenish your own uh, uh, immune system. Uh, but what's very unfortunate was that um, there is a virus called uh, EBV, uh, which stands for Ebar virus, uh, and that's known to cause things like leukemia. Um, so people who have EBV uh, might not get leukemia uh, all the time because um, their immune system is able to suppress the virus. Uh, but um, what happens is the sister had EBV but with no symptoms. But once the bone marrow transplantation occur, because the boy didn't have a complete immune system at the time, um, the virus uh, manifested itself. And uh, shortly after the transplantation, the boy um, actually died uh, from the, uh, from the uh, Ebar virus related uh, illness. 
Um, and so, you know, they actually made a movie uh, for this. If you're interested, you can probably search it up on, um, on YouTube or something. So nowadays, um, we use gene therapy f to correct for SCID. Um, the idea is to replace the defective uh, gene with a functional copy. Uh, and, you know, uh, there are promising results, right? Uh, bubble babies, they, as they're called now, uh, still exist. People still are born with skid nowadays. Uh, and by uh, using gene therapy, uh, maybe we'll be able to fix this problem uh, in the near future. Uh, ACE, uh, uh, acquired immune uh, deficiency syndrome, or um, the um, uh, which is caused by the HIV virus, uh, that can um, uh, shut down your entire immune uh, system because the HIV virus uh, actually has a preference in infecting things like macrophages, APCs, and helper T cells. And you know that the APCs and the macrophages are important for activating the acquired immunity. And so without those, you basically don't have any uh, cell-mediated response. And even if you are able to get some T cells, the helper T cells will also be infected by the HIV. And so you will not have any antibody uh, uh, production capability. And for that reason, people with HIV are very susceptible to uh, common infections. And, you know, usually they die because of these common infections uh, and not because of the HIV themselves. Now, the interesting thing is this. Some people um, do not get HIV uh, at all because they have a mutation in something called a CXCR uh, receptor. So uh, in order for the virus to gain entries to these uh, cells, they require that receptor. And if you have a mutation in that receptor, the virus actually does not recognize it uh, and therefore not going to be able to uh, uh, infect the cells. Uh, and so people with that mutation are immune to HIV. So that created a very interesting case. There was someone uh, 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 name, uh, uh, there is someone, he's still alive, uh, called, named Timothy uh, Ray Brown. Uh, and for the longest time, he was referred to as just the uh, Berlin patient. So what happens uh, was this, he uh, had uh, 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 HIV uh, and uh, for um, another reason, uh, unrelated reason, he uh, needed a bone marrow transplantation, okay? So they found a donor for him, uh, a match uh, donor, uh, and they gave him the uh, a bone marrow transplantation. And what was really surprising to the doctors at the time was that after the bone marrow transplantation, um, they started noticing his HIV uh, viral load uh, start to go down and eventually it was completely uh, gone. So essentially he was uh, uh, cured from the HIV uh, because of the bone marrow transplantation. So what happened was that the, uh, the donor, the bone marrow uh, donor, uh, happened to have that mutation that I was talking about, the CXCR mutation. Uh, and as a result, um, when uh, he donated his bone marrow, uh, 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 all that new uh, white cells that uh, Timothy made uh, also contained that same mutation and therefore the virus uh, ran out of things to infect uh, and it just kind of uh, 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 cured, um, uh, cured him. Um, so this is very, very rare uh, because number one, um, the number of people who have that CXCR uh, mutation is super, super rare, uh, perhaps like 0.1% of the entire world's population. Uh, and in, you know, if you, if, even if you find someone who has that mutation, um, they have to be a suitable bone marrow do donor uh, in order for this to occur. Um, so uh, that uh, was the only case uh, up until last year. So last year, um, there was a second case uh, uh, where another HIV patient was cured um, by the same uh, uh, means. Uh, and that's when uh, Timothy decided to um, no longer remain anonymous. He wanted to tell his stories, right? Basically to give hope to other uh, HIV patients uh, um, and tell them about uh, his... Let's take a look at the different types of vaccines. Now, before we... Um, talk about that. There are some questions that I want you to consider. Okay, so you can pause the video and think about um, these things. Um, true or false? Vaccines contain live virus or bacteria. Okay, so think about that. Um, what's what's your belief? What's what, what do you think uh, 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 about this statement? Uh, next one. Okay, uh, a common uh, thing that people say. Okay, I don't I don't want to get the flu shot because I don't want to get the flu. But can you? Like, can the flu shot give you the actual flu? Uh, and here is another common statement that you uh, hear people say. 
uh, that mercury is used as a preservative in the vaccine. So are these statements true? Are some of them true? Uh, or are they, are they all false? Right? So that's what we're going to um, try to address um, in the upcoming slides. First, the goal of immunization. Right? The purpose of immunizations um, are, are threefold. Okay? First, we aim to have eradication. So eradication is the best possible outcome of any immunization program. Okay, um, in, in eradication, you are going to be able to remove the the uh, pathogens completely on a global scale. Okay, so so that disease will no longer exist, uh, and and that's the best possible outcome. Um, sadly, we've only successfully eradicated one. Um, uh, uh, pathogens um, through vaccination, uh, and that was the case with uh, with smallpox. Okay, and since then, uh, even though we've developed vaccines um, for many other uh, pathogens, uh, we are not we were not able to eradicate uh, any additional diseases. Okay, and we're going to talk about why uh, when we discuss the ethics of vaccinations uh, in the next lecture. Um, the, another goal is elimination. Okay, so um, if we are not able to eradicate it, right, uh, maybe we can make the disease disappear from one area. Okay, but it's still going to be a, a problem for some areas in the world. Okay, um, and that certainly is the case for polio, uh, which is a virus that uh, could cause uh, uh, um, paralysis in, uh, in, in, in kids, uh, as well as measles, which is another one uh, that is... Um, uh, are going to be uh, causing quite a bit of problem uh, in, in, in kids. Um, so these diseases, for the most part, has been eliminated in Western countries, uh, but they are still prevalent uh, in some other parts of the world. Um, and, you know, due to the reluctance to uh, get vaccination uh, for, for, for children um, because of these uh, anti-vaccines uh, movements uh, recently, uh, you have seen cases of polio and even measles uh, re-emerging in the, in the U.S. Uh, as well as uh, for measles in, uh, in Canada. So uh, another uh, outcome for immunization is to control. So the disease no longer constitutes a significant public health uh, problem. Okay, so something such as neonatal tetanus, which is something that the, uh, the baby can catch uh, from infected mothers, but because most people are vaccinated against tetanus nowadays, um, that is no longer uh, a big um, significant public health problem. When pharmaceutical companies develop vaccines, um, they would try to keep these things uh, in mind. Okay, this, These are uh, a list of properties um, that we would like to see in the ideal vaccines. Okay, um, But it's rarely possible to, to, to hit all of them Okay, at the same time. Uh, but ideally speaking, you would want the vaccines to have all these uh, properties. So at the very least, um, the vaccine must be immunogenic. Okay, so this must be true for all vaccines. To be immunogenic means it's able to trigger, to trigger an immune, immune response. Okay, so uh, that's the whole point. The vaccine is to educate your immune system. So when the real thing comes, uh, you're going to be ready for it. Okay, um, you want the uh, immunity that you've created from the vaccine. You want it to be long lasting. Um, that's n not always the case. Uh, some vaccines you need to uh, uh, get revaccinated re later on in life. So um, take tetanus, for example, um, the immunity kind of uh, diminishes over time uh, and you would need another shot um, perhaps in, um, in 20 years from the first one. Uh, and of course, all vaccines need to be uh, safe. Um, it's important to understand side effects versus safety, okay? Um, Vaccines are likely to have uh, 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 side effects. Okay, it might cause people to have uh, uh, fever. It might cause people to have uh, sore arms, and and those are acceptable side effects. It's just um, uh, 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 a result uh, of how your immune system is working, right? After all. In vaccination, you are introducing a foreign um, agent into the body, uh, and 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 you're trying to trigger the immune response, right? So in responding to the vaccine, it's 
normal to have to have a fever uh, in response to that. And, and having the fever doesn't mean it wasn't a safe vaccine. Uh, uh, but safety, of course, is very important. We don't want any unintended uh, side effects, right? So, uh, of course, vaccines go through uh, vigorous testing uh, before they're deployed um, uh, and, uh, and, and used commercially. Um, we want the vaccine to be stable in field conditions. Uh, a lot of times, um, even though vaccines might be uh, created and developed in um, in in, um, in developed countries, uh, but a lot, of, a lot of times the vaccines are used in developing countries. Uh, and so, um, you know, some of these developing countries might not have the infrastructure uh, to um, to store the vaccines, okay? Uh, there might not be refrigeration, for example. Uh, and, you know, you might have to transport the vaccines over a large distance. So you want the vaccines to to not break down during the transport. Uh, and, 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 and so you want it to be stable in few conditions. Um, a, a, an ideal vaccines would be a combined vaccines, uh, meaning uh, it would offer protections for multiple, multiple uh, diseases. Okay, so um, nowadays uh, when, when kids get their immunization uh, uh, early on in life, um, sometimes they get like a, a, a five in one vaccine or seven in one vaccines. So that single vaccines will give you protections for up to five diseases. Okay, uh, and ideally speaking, it would also be uh, just uh, requiring a single dose. Uh, some vaccines require a boosters, right? Um, so, so you know, multiple doses are required before the effect is um, is going to protect uh, to before the uh, protection is going to be a high percentage, right? Uh, but ideally speaking, you want it to work with just one dose. Uh, and lastly, you want it to be affordable and accessible uh, to all. Okay, Making vaccines are not cheap. Okay, uh, There are government subsidies, uh, um, but uh, that we, we don't normally pay for uh, the vaccines. Uh, that is on the uh, immunization schedule of, um, of Ontario, for example. Uh, but if you were to get something that's not on the schedule, uh, say if you want to get hepatitis uh, uh, a, a shot vaccine um, because you're going on uh, vacation to tropical areas, for example, um, then you have to pay out of pocket. Okay, uh, but ideally speaking, the vaccines should be affordable uh, and and accessible uh, to all. Here are some uh, common viral vaccines. Uh, vaccines can protect you uh, against viral infections and uh, bacterial infections as well. Uh, but um, uh, I think there are more vaccines for viruses uh, than there are uh, for bacteria. So there are different types of vaccines. Uh, we are gonna be looking at um, three types uh, in the upcoming slides. Um, the first one is what we call live attenuated vaccines. So one of the first true or false question I asked you was that um, are there live virus and bacteria in the vaccines? The answer to that question is um, yes, for some vaccines, there are live uh, 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 agents within the vaccines. However, these are attenuated versions of the virus. Okay, that means the virus, the live virus that are used in these vaccines, has been weakened in such a way that it is not going to cause serious illness in people with healthy immune system. Okay, so um, essentially they have taken away the uh, uh, disease-causing part of the of the virus. Uh, and just kind of leave an empty shell uh, 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 um, to be used to educate your immune system. So when the real thing comes, um, you will have the immunity uh, to fight it off, okay? However, the live version, um, the live attenuated vaccines are not suitable for everybody, okay? Uh, if you have a weakened immune system, okay, such as people with HIV, for example, or people who are born uh, uh, that are immunocompromised, um, they will not be able to take these vaccines. Uh, people who are undergoing chemotherapy are typically going to have weakened immune systems. Um, they are not uh, going to be able to take live vaccines either. Uh, and finally, uh, pregnant women, uh, they are also not suitable for live attenuated vaccines. So examples of um, uh, uh, live attenuated vaccines include the uh, MMR vaccines, uh, which is uh, a combined vaccines for protection against measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, and there is also the uh, varicella, which is the uh, chickenpox vaccine. 
Another type of vaccines are, uh, is what we call inactivated uh, vaccines. So these vaccines are made from inactivating the virus during the process of making the vaccines, uh, and, and, and they are completely dead, okay? Uh, and, uh, uh, but still has the antigens on them, uh, and that's what you need to educate your immune system, right? Uh, so an example, of this would be uh, would be the polio vaccines. Now they are a little bit less effective compared to the live attenuated uh, because the live attenuated is the closest things to nature, right? Um, so typically they are quite good at uh, uh, creating permanent um, immune protection for that illness. Um, so for in in inactivated vaccine, you usually would need to have uh, multiple doses. So up to this point, we've talked about uh, live attenuated and inactivated vaccines, uh, both of which are not going to be able to cause the uh, actual diseases. Okay, in fact, uh, no vaccine is going to give you the real disease. Okay, um, so if you think back to the true or false questions that we thought about, can you get the flu from the flu shot? Um, the answer is no, you cannot. Okay, the, the flu virus uh, that is in the flu vaccine has been inactivated, okay? It's incapable of causing disease. But you still hear people say, you know, I every time I get the flu shot, I, I end up getting the flu, okay? So a couple of um, things to consider there. Uh, number one, the flu shot is not 100% protection. In fact, there are so many strings of flu circulating out there uh, the World Health Organization actually predicts the top three strains that will be circulating in any given uh, a flu season. And then they make a vaccine for those three strains. Uh, and sometimes their prediction is wrong. So the flu shot for that um, season might not be as effective. Okay, so you can still catch the flu. Uh, and, you know, some people would say, I get the flu shot and then, you know, right away I had the flu. Uh, in those instances, maybe the person already caught the flu virus uh, before they got the uh, flu shot, and it's just a coincidence um, that um, that it's happening at the same time. Okay, so receiving the flu shot will not give you immediate protection. You still have to develop the antibodies. Okay, so if you already have the flu virus in you, getting the flu shot will not protect you. Uh, it will protect you from future flu infections, but the current one you're having, um, you are likely still going to experience the symptoms from it. And here is the third type of vaccines, uh, which is called uh, toxoid and conjugate. Um, so rather than immunizing uh, against the bacteria themselves, um, sometimes the bacteria is really good at hiding um, their antigens uh, on the surface, uh, and that helps them uh, to evade the immune system. Uh, and this type of vaccines is kind of like a solution uh, towards that. Okay, um, The toxoid vaccine is going to uh, 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 be um, uh, creating immunity against toxins that are produced by the disease uh, causing bacteria rather than the actual bacteria themselves. Uh, and uh, an example of that would be tetanus. Okay, So in tetanus, the bacteria actually produce a toxin um, that would cause the muscle to, uh, to lock in place, uh, causing you to not be able to move. Uh, and, and it's the toxin that's causing the disease rather than the actual bacteria, uh, so to speak. And so uh, with this type of vaccines, uh, you would neutralize uh, the toxins rather than uh, going after the bacteria. Uh, and another example of that is the uh, DTAP, uh, which contains uh, the diphtheria and uh, tetanus um, toxoids. So the last question uh, is, are there mercuries in the, uh, in the vaccines? Well, this is a, a, a complicated uh, a question, okay? Now, on the left side here, that, that's what mercury looks like. This is elemental, elemental mercury, okay? Um, this is the stuff that you uh, have in uh, thermometers, in the old ones anyways, the, uh, because it's, it's very dangerous, the mercury is, okay? Uh, it's actually toxic. Um, so newer thermometers, uh, we replace it with alcohol. But old thermometers, um, there used to be mercury, okay? So this is elemental mercury. That means mercury by itself, okay? The symbol for mercury is Xg. Now, is this stuff in the vaccine? The answer is no, absolutely not, okay? There are no elemental uh, mercury in the vaccines whatsoever. Okay, the mercury that people are worrying about is actually found in a compound. Okay, called thimerosal. 
okay? And the thimerosal is, is shown here in this compound, uh, and, and there, is, um, there is a mercury atom in the entire structure. Now, it's very different to have an uh, element in a compound compared to its elemental forms. Let me give you an example. Sodium, sodium on its own, it's very explosive, okay? You drop sodium into water, it will blow up, okay? Uh, chlorine is also very toxic, okay? Chlorine is what's used in like toxic gas in, uh, in World War II, okay, the mustard gas, I think, uh, and, and it's very, very toxic. But if you combine the two of them, you get NaCl, which is table salt, okay? So table salt, we, we sprinkle it on our fries, okay? It doesn't blow up, it's not gonna kill us, it's very, very safe, okay? So the point here is when the elements are on their own, their properties are actually very different compared to when it's in a compound, when it's in a molecule, okay? So the mercury uh, atom in the thimerosal is behaving very differently than the elemental mercury. So there are no elemental mercury uh, in the vaccines. Uh, the question is, are, are this stuff, the thimerosal, uh, is that in the vaccine? Well, uh, in Canada, okay, since March 2001, uh, there are no more thimerosal. Okay, that that's the um, that's the compound I was showing you on the previous slide. Okay, there are no vaccines containing thimerosal uh, uh, for routine use in in children vaccination. Okay, with the exception of some influenza vaccine. Okay, uh, and 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 the the flu vaccine in some cases are drawn from multiple dose vial. Okay, so you have this big vial and you just kind of keep on uh, taking it out of the same vial. Um, that usually happens if you're trying to vaccinate, you know, many people at the same time, like at a school or something like that. Uh, and the thimerosal is used as a safeguard against contamination of the vial. Okay, so uh, if the flu shot is from a single dose vial or if it's from a, a pre-filled syringe, uh, then there will not be uh, uh, the thimerosal in them, okay? So the next question people ask is, um, you know, is thimerosal dangerous? Well, you probably have heard of people say, you know, uh, consuming a certain type of fish uh, too much, especially the deep ocean uh, kind of fish is not good for you because you're going to get mercury poisoning. Now, that kind of mercury, the one that you get from, you know, eating uh, fish like, like wild tuna or something like that, uh, that kind of mercury is uh, a part of what we call the methyl mercury, okay? And that is something that could build up in the body over time uh, and, and you cannot get rid of it easily. Okay, uh, uh, and, and if you have built up sufficient amount of that, uh, methylmercury, uh, it's going to cause damage to the nervous system. The thimerosal that we're talking about, the one that is found only in multi-dose uh, 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 vials uh, for influenza uh, vaccine, uh, that is actually going to be broken down into a different type of mercury called the ethyl mercury. Now, this type of mercury is not going to build up in the body because it's not fat soluble. It doesn't dissolve well in, 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 in fat. Uh, and so uh, they are going to be removed from the body uh, quite quickly. Okay. So uh, is there mercury in the vaccines? Not the elemental mercury, uh, but there is something called thimerosal, uh, which is used as a preservative and, and that contains uh, a mercury atom in it. Uh, however, uh, in Canada, since 2001, uh, only, only flu shots that are drawn from multi-use vials contain the thimerosal. So is this safe? Yes, it's safe um, based on many, many, many studies, okay? Uh, because when the small amount of thimerosal does get into your body, your body will quickly break it down into uh, a form of uh, ethyl mercury, uh, which is then going to be excreted uh, from the body through um, through the urine, uh, and so uh, it doesn't stay in the body. It's not going to have any uh, harmful effect. Um, and that is it for uh, all the background information uh, on uh, vaccination. Um, next lecture, we will be discussing the uh, ethics of vaccinations. We'll be talking about things like uh, uh, vaccination mandates. Uh, 
uh, we'll be talking about um, the uh, research process of, of vaccines, uh, as well as uh, the um, concept of consent when it comes to uh, receiving uh, vaccines. So uh, that's it for, for, for this week. Uh, thanks very much for watching.